Thanks very much for joining us. Today's theme is cryptocurrency for lawyers. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are no longer a fringe investment activity. A large proportion of the Australian population now has them. So anyone that's writing a will for somebody who might own crypto assets or is managing an estate where the, um, uh, the deceased has invested in cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin or something along those lines, needs to know the basics about how to find them and what to do with them. I'm joined today from uh, Sydney by Evan Buchtis and Anthony Colony, uh, Colony, sorry, Connolly, my apologies, uh, and they're from the team at McGrath Nickel. McGrath Nickel is a multidisciplinary advisory practice, and they are um, the people of choice to call in where you have a digital um, incident uh, and you need forensic uh, investigations, and also uh, a lot of their exposure in the crypto markets come from doing a large scale receiverships where the uh, asset base is predominantly digital or involves cryptocurrencies. Thanks very much for your time today. It's um, a, a topic that many lawyers uh, know a little bit about, but we need to get on top of. Uh, are you able to give us just a brief overview of how cryptocurrencies are bought and sold and what you should be looking for if you were, say, managing an estate? Yeah. Sure, and uh, thanks for having us first and foremost. Um, I, I think um, you know digital assets are, are in a very unique place at the moment, where we've got the you know you have retail investors have ample opportunity to buy you know the digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and even NFTs. Um, so generally speaking, when you're looking to purchase digital assets, you're you're going to what's called a digital currency exchange or, or a virtual asset virtual asset service provider, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Um, but essentially, these these businesses, these digital businesses, uh, operate a what's known as an on and off ramp into the digital realm. That is the ability to purchase cryptocurrencies from your from your cash, and then alternatively, on the other hand, uh, swapping your cryptocurrencies back back to cash, in which they would then provide you with the, with those currencies. You can go and, and, and cash out at your bank. So, um, generally speaking, this is how cryptocurrency uh, investors uh, uh, ordinarily get involved. There are businesses that do exist uh, that you can purchase directly, what's known as a P2P transaction. So you can deal with directly a seller of Bitcoin as opposed to dealing with an exchange. But for, for, for the most part, we're dealing with, uh, you know, th through this cryptocurrency, digital currency exchange businesses. So um, if I'm correct, is, does it operate more like a, a bank where you hand them your cash and then they go away and they invest it for you? Or is it a bit more like a stockbroker where... Uh, they purchase it, but it, it ends up in your name. That, that's a really good point. Um, I, and I actually read some press recently about they're actually coming out and, and being maybe defined as a, as a quasi-bank. So they're actually operating as that broker, but in addition to being an exchange. So uh, traditionally, um, and, and you know, in, in the early days of cryptocurrencies, when primarily Bitcoin was the, uh, was the only coin available, these cryptocurrency businesses, these exchanges operated purely to be an on and off ramp. So that is buy and sell Bitcoin, and they didn't uh, enter in, into any of these additional investment services or, or what we know to be, you know, traditional financial instruments that you can, you know, go and lending and borrowing and, and earning interest. That only really came about in the last few years. Um, so uh, to answer your question, uh, some do operate as this traditional on and off ramp without offering any additional services, but as this technology develops and as time has progressed and the, int in, in the introductory of decentralized finance or DeFi, these exchanges are offering additional financial services that are giving the investors the ability to make additional yield, additional interest, uh, and that is where customer funds can, can often be repurposed or reallocated uh, in the interest of the broader uh, business to try and earn that interest that they're promising their customers. Okay. And so from a practical perspective for a lawyer, I assume if the uh, intermediary is holding the cryptocurrency and investing it on the um, on the punter's behalf, then there is at least an entity you can contact, explain that somebody's died, prove it to them, and then they can transfer the asset to you. So, uh, presumably that's the trade-off. And so where somebody's um, operated through more the stockbroker market, the stockbroker model, they've simply purchased it, handed over their keys, and then that's their job done as far as they're concerned. How do you go about actually trying to track these things down and turn them into real cash money that you can send off to the, um, uh, to the beneficiaries? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think on, on that question, it's important to probably distinguish the, the, the two types of custody arrangements um, when dealing with these assets. So yeah, in this space, we've got what's known as a custodial service. And these are those exchanges that I mentioned earlier uh, that do sort of generally hold what we know as private keys, or they generally hold the actual assets that you're entitled to. Um, so when you're dealing with an exchange, uh, generally speaking, uh, your crypto assets that you may own, you have a contractual right to, or you have an ob have an obligation to uh, make make a claim against a particular asset, um, as opposed to actually controlling that asset yourself. Um, in what's known as a non-custodial arrangement, uh, that is, you actually hold the public and private keys on your person, thus retaining full control over those assets. So, in a custodial arrangement, uh, if you are looking to secure assets, you will need to reach out to that particular business, that exchange, or that custody provider, and then go through that process, request the information, provide the information, whether it's a death certificate or otherwise, to get access to those funds. Um, in the context of a non-custodial arrangement, there needs to be the appropriate controls in place should somebody um, pass suddenly, uh, because without those private keys, uh, getting access to those digital assets uh, can be extremely cumbersome. Uh, and probably further to the point, you, you generally cannot get access to the digital assets without those private keys. So it is imperative and it is critically important uh, if you are holding funds in a non-custodial arrangement, uh, you're making the appropriate um, procedures, processes, and, and you're giving those private keys to either somebody that can hold them for you. There are dedicated businesses out there that can hold your private keys in trust. Um, or you're at least advising them in a will or some sort of you know document uh, where these private keys are in the event that you are no longer able to to you know get those keys for who you need to provide them to. So when you say private key, are we we're talking a great big long password here. It's a, an entirely digital creature, isn't it? There's no physical dongle. It's not recorded anywhere physically. Yeah. So I, I think the best way to think about it is when you think of a public key, it, it's very much like a bank account. I got like a public address. I can give you my my public key, uh, and that is used to then to, uh, receive funds on my part. Uh, and again, a very much a public address. Um, in terms of a private key, uh, that is it is similar to to a password, except it cannot be changed, and it, it is definitely held to be held in private, and is often in in the form of a twelve or twenty four mnemonic phrase. Um, now, it it is recommended, and again, everybody does have a different approach uh, that it is physically stored to avoid any hacks. You know, confidential information breaches uh, on on your infrastructure, on your systems, on your network, on your computer, uh, to very much hold those, whether it's in a safe or some you know nondescript, uh, very much secret location um, that you only know and can access. Okay, so how are they transferred about? So when you when you get onto Crypto HQ and you give them your hundred grand and they issue your your Bitcoin or um, any other. Uh, coin. So how do they actually send them to you? Is, is there going to be an email somewhere where you can go start looking in the email and then you'll find public and private keys? Or is there going to be a, a, a different transfer mechanism? Yeah, sure. So that's, a, that's a good question. So generally speaking, um, in these custodial services or custodial arrangements where uh, the institution or the custody provider will retain the private keys, um, if you purchase $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, let's call it, uh, your account or your balance in that particular platform will, will be you know, $100,000 worth of Bitcoin at, at a point in time price. Um, now, those assets are uh, retained within the platform and that is, that is where that road ends. In a non-custodial arrangement, you will buy the assets in the same fashion. That is, you'll, you'll go to a digital currency platform, go to an exchange, buy your cryptocurrency. But then what you will do from that point is go to that platform and then you will transfer the funds from that business to a wallet or public address under the control of you. So that is, again, uh, you will retain the public and private keys for that non-custodial arrangement, moving it out of the control of that digital currency business. Okay. So that wallet is going to be, what, an app on somebody's phone or is it uh, a website? And how, how do you go about finding them? Yeah, definitely. So there, there are there are various types of um, you know non-custodial applications, services, wallets. So it could be an application on your phone, an application on your computer. Um, there are third-party applications that provide you the ability to to have a non-custodial arrangement. So um, you know a bucket term is just generally you know none of these cryptocurrency businesses, uh, and and generally speaking, an application on your phone computer or otherwise okay so i imagine it's pretty tempting uh, if you've got these really great big long complex uh, identifiers and, and passwords you just leave them in the app and so 
um, that's fine if somebody gets access to that app, but if it's behind your fingerprint and, and nobody else ever gets in, um, what should somebody who's preparing a will and advising somebody that owns these assets say that they should do with these keys? I mean, how, how should they be properly stored? Because I'm assuming if you um, print it out and your cleaner gets it, if they know what they're looking at, they can, it's like a bearer bomb, they can just go in and clean you out. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, very much so. So in addition to being an access me mechanism for your wallet, it actually serves as a recovery point. So if you lose your non-custodial device, whether it's an application, whether you lose access to your application or device, you can then recover your assets with this private key or, or seed phrase. So uh, it does serve multiple purposes, but in terms of storing your private address, uh, that should be retained within um, some sort of trust arrangement where, where that specific seed phrase, that specific private key is retained in, in trust and behind closed doors, not available to the cleaners or anybody else that has visibility. Um, alternatively, uh, you know, it, it is recommended or it is mentioned that you may, for example, keep it in, in, in your own custody outside of the visibility of a trust, whether it's in a safe and then obviously who got access to that particular safe, for example, um, has access to that particular private key. So it very much is a trade-off between providing that, that, that private key to somebody putting it, for example, in the in the trusted hands of a third party with the with the knowledge that, okay, this isn't in my control anymore, but it should be safe um, when comparing that to, okay, I've got it in my control, in my house, for example, in my safe. Um, something could happen to my safe, and we've seen examples of that um, in our business. Um, but yeah, it, it is a trade-off and comes down to that particular individual uh, and their considerations and their situation um, in, in terms of their digital asset portfolio. So presumably, uh, you mentioned hacking. I, I understand that there is specialist malware out there that uh, that goes looking for pri uh, private keys, uh, hunts them down, and then siphons them off, and then um, that is effectively the asset gone. So, what's your recommendation in terms of, you know, from a um, somebody who says yes, I, I need to get it out of my app so that my dad can get it if they need it? Um, what's the the best practice in your view? Yeah, I think first and foremost that that shouldn't be retained on your on your device or for, or in the same location uh, as your application. So uh, if you've got a, for example, your computer at home and then you've got your private key in the same room in a notepad, that probably isn't recommended. If somebody breaks into your house, uh, they can see your computer, and if they know what they're looking for, if they if they're aware of what a twenty four you know seed phrase looks like, they'll actually be cluey enough to then be okay. This particular individual owns some cryptocurrency. I'll take that seed phrase, uh, and you know when I'm ready. And when I have a plan in place, I'll move those assets without without them knowing. Um, so yeah, it is very much you know in consideration for for those involved. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of protecting the computer more generally, I'm assuming that uh, you know all the usual rules. You patch. You make sure that you've got um, a uh, up to date virus scanning um, that you encrypt they any particular files where you're holding um, assets and the apps themselves. Are there any other sort of best practices that uh, McGrath Nickel would recommend in terms of uh, this is more for the, we'll move on to what the practitioners do once they get a copy and um, presumably they've got to put that on their network somewhere. Um, so what's your recommendation? Do you open up the digital source where that uh, key has been located, you check what you're looking at, and then presumably you delete it from your connected network and you, you keep it on a flash drive or something along those lines? Is this from the practitioner's perspective, sorry, in terms of securing these assets? Is that, is that your question? Yes. So I'm assuming at some point that you've, you've spoken to your client about where they should store them or the family brings it in. They says, I don't quite know what this is, but, you know, my son said that all of the cryptocurrencies are on here. Um, presumably you've got to have a look. Do you recommend, so once you've opened them up, are they, can they be stolen from the network or um, do you need to delete or empty a cache or something along those lines? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and, and it, it's an interesting question because it's probably something a bit different to, to ordinary circumstances, and, and it is due to the inherent open public nature of blockchain technology. If, if somebody is querying the balance, for example, of a particular address, a particular wallet, um, you know, somebody with the, with the correct tool set, you know, such as McGraw Nickel, um, can actually look at that particular balance of that particular wallet without actually going and needing the private keys. Um, that, that is a real benefit. You know, you can go to any address, any wallet, uh, and identify a current balance where they were sending or receiving funds from. So if there's a, you know, a family 
querying a somebody within their families, their, their digital portfolio, their asset, their balance, you know, their balance at a point in time. We can actually have a look at that, a look at that balance, look at that portfolio without requiring that particular family or these individuals providing us the private keys. So it just avoids that unnecessary handling of confidential or sensitive information, such as a private key, where we can actually evaluate a balance, a portfolio uh, in our specialist software without moving those private keys around until we need to. There may not be an actual need for us to take control of those assets if the situation isn't hostile. Um, you know, again, there, there will be situations, and Anthony can talk to some of those situations a little bit more where it isn't the best interest of insolvency practitioners to move assets. But um, if we're querying a balance, a portfolio um, for the benefit of a family in a in a in a in a, in a death death scenario, um, it'd be very much querying the open public blockchain for that information. Okay, so basically, how does a practitioner? Um, you know, the scenario, common scenario would be a bereaved mum and dad comes in or, or a spouse and says, yeah, I know he was investing in crypto. He's always saying how much uh, money he'd made on it, but I don't know anything about that. Um, you know, what does the practitioner need to ask for? Do they need the laptop and the phone? Or um, presumably they can just call you and then you guys can explain what's needed to then start the hunt. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much it. So, I mean, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't differ too much from existing practices where we're acquiring and, and, and triaging electronic evidence, for example. So if this particular individual is dealing, buying and selling digital assets on his computer using a third-party application, we'll get visibility into that. Alternatively, for example, uh, there may be information retained in, in bank statements that would give the family and any anybody looking into his affairs uh, the ability to identify what particular digital currency exchange he may be purchasing assets from. For example, if it's identified within bank, bank statements that this particular individual is purchasing $20,000 worth of Bitcoin a month from Australian-based exchange CoinSpot, uh, we can approach CoinSpot with the confidence that this particular investor was using their service uh, and then go and ask the, the appropriate questions from there of that business with that information on hand. So step one is go to the bank account, uh, sorry, go to the bank statements, look for anything with the word coin in it, and that's a, possibly a good start. Are there any other magic phrases that we should be looking for? Um, I, I think I think investigators or anybody looking through somebody's affairs should be aware of the key players within the space. So, so whether it's coin or crypto or something to that, to that effect, um, investigators and just general, you know, insolvency practitioners alike should be aware of what these key terms would look like, these key businesses operating in this space. Um, on the other hand, if it is, a, for example, a bit more of a hostile situation where we need to identify where assets may exist outside of bank statements, there is also the ability to go looking through things like email data and file server data, looking for, for example, specific traits of cryptocurrencies existing on someone in somebody's email, in somebody's you know personal documentation. Um, now, to the benefit of investigators and practitioners alike, uh, these addresses actually conform to a specific pattern, such that that pattern can actually be triaged in a broader data set. So, for example, Bitcoin addresses are very specific in their nature. So we can we can triage, and we've done that uh, as part of a granical investigation, triage a, a data set of five million records, uh, and of that five million records, identify seventeen specific emails within this record, this, this data set that contained a specific Bitcoin address where funds were set were being sent and received from. So there are there are a number of ways to approach it, and each scenario would be slightly different in how you approach that from an investigator or practitioner perspective. Okay. And what sort of cost would be involved? So presumably, you know, how long is the piece of string? And if they've hidden it well, <laughs> and you'd be looking through a lot of, a lot of potential data. But just for your, you know, average person, obviously you don't want to rack up five thousand dollars worth in search costs and find out that uh, the ten thousand they'd invested is now worth five hundred bucks in a and an old pocket full of buttons. So um, where does the the kind of outlay start? Yeah, I mean, it is it is a little bit of a how long is a piece of string remark. Um, although I I, th I think some of that can actually go back onto the family or or maybe the you know the, the people involved, where it may be something as simple as uh, a bank statement identifying that crypto assets do exist. So we might actually have, we might we might not need to be involved from the start, such that we are actually triaging information. It may be something as simple as going through the bank statements or or, or doing a search through bank statements looking for crypto exchanges or, or similar terms to identify transactions. If it does come to a point where we need to look at, for example, email data and file server data, the cost generally would come down to how much data is involved. So, I mean, if, if you're looking at a thousand documents, um, generally the cost wouldn't be as high. Uh, but in the context of five million documents, that obviously is where cost can can, can greatly increase um, because the, the, the bulk of the cost actually comes from 
the processing of significant amounts of data as opposed to triaging that data for cryptocurrency addresses. So the, 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 the most compute intensive part is definitely the processing of significant volumes of data as opposed to triaging it itself. Right. So just pulling it out of the database and getting it into a state where you mm. can interrogate it and then the actual interrogation, that's pretty much straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it is very very similar to a sort of a standard discovery process where you're, where you're, where you're taking books and records uh, and you're processing those for the benefit of, you know, running key, you know, keyword searches or, or, or the like. So very similar to that, except of these keyword search terms, uh, we're applying our analytics looking for specific cryptocurrency addresses. Thank you. Um, Anthony, if I can bring you in. Um, working on the scenario that we've built so far, so we've got a, a fairly standard estate, something in the uh, bank records indicates that there may have been some um, crypto investment, but it doesn't really tell you exactly where you need to go uh, looking for that. What's the next step? How do you practically move it forward to ascertain the uh, the value of those investments and how to act- and then how to recover them? Thanks, David. Good question. Uh, pleasingly, the answers are very similar. So, if you are talking about a deceased estate, an investigation in a family law context, a winding up, or a receivership or any other context where you're looking for crypto assets, the process is broadly similar. And as Evan has explained, the first step is ascertaining whether we think crypto is involved at all. And that can be done by looking at bank statements, as an example. If you find that there are crypto assets involved, we then talked about going through the process of triaging through data to try and find an address. And that's the key. If you have an address, the blockchain itself is very open. It's incredibly transparent, and it's been designed that way. What it means is that any party can then use that address, and I've done this myself, to put it into a public search engine and to find exactly what assets are sitting in there. So let's say there is a decentralized wallet. If you know the address of it, you can very quickly identify what sits within it. And that can be incredibly important because a person may assert that they don't have assets, and that's a way of finding that they do. Or a person who's deceased may not be able to tell you whether they do or don't have assets, but if you can find, as I say, that address, you can then ascertain exactly what assets are in it. And they may be in the form of Bitcoin, which we've talked about, non-fungible tokens or NFTs for short, which Evan touched upon. And they might be in a plethora of other coins, some of which are quite common, others of which are terribly obscure. And in one particular matter that we were dealing with, we did in fact have over 40 different types of coin, some of which had substantial value, some of which didn't. So we're not talking Swiss bank account situation here where you need uh, you know, a helicopter with, with uh, guys with machine guns to get into the place to find the information. So if you find that, if you know the, the address, then you, anyone can go and look it up. You don't even need a court order. Is that correct? That's right. And as Evan mentioned earlier, there is a public key, which is akin to, for example, a bank statement number. And the way the blockchain works is entirely open and transparent. So as I say, if you know that number, you can see it all. But without the private key, you can't touch it. Okay. So now we can see it. Um, how do we get it back and, and turn it into real cash money that uh, people can spend on their school fees? Great question. And as Evan said before, the real key is, as I say, getting that private key. If you have a person who is deceased, we talked before about making sure that before that eventuality, they make sure that somebody in a third party position, an executor, a trustee, a solicitor, or indeed just a trusted family member, should have a copy of the seed phrase, which will allow them to recover the assets. That's a good ex ante step. If we get to an ex post step, the issue is if you don't have the private key, even if you can see a public public address, you can see the wallet, you actually can't get into it. That's why having accounts on exchanges are better in as much as exchange can assist. And as we touched on earlier, most will respond to a court order for production. Right. Does your average retail investor know that they're whether they're using a custodial or a non-custodial service? Because I imagine a lot of people, you know, they just get an app that their mate was using and then they feed some money into it and they wouldn't really know what's going on under the hood. Do, do people are people aware of the need to then record their private key? It's a good question, and perhaps that's a very a very important suggestion for solicitors dealing with clients is to actually ask them that question. Do you appreciate what sort of arrangement you have? Do you have an on-exchange account, in which case that might be okay? Or do you have a decentralised finance wallet, in which case you should really be thinking about these things and making sure that uh, you have, for example, a safe deposit box with the seed phrase in it or a trusted family member who knows what it is and where it is but not to be released unless certain circumstances arise. 
or probably the best option is to give it to your solicitor and make sure that they have it in a custodial or executor capacity. Right, okay. So bottom line, uh, there is no plan B if it's a non-custodial arrangement and somebody can't get that code. Um, but of course, the trade-off is that anyone that does get that code, um, they can just send you a postcard from wherever they've moved to and um, let you know how much they're enjoying your money. That's right, and that is exactly the trade-off. And in a matter that Evan and I were working on recently, which was a court-ordered receivership of certain crypto assets, it was very important that we get hold of the keys, and, and thankfully we did have cooperation from the other side, uh, from the person who was the subject of the orders. But if you don't have that cooperation, that's where you might need coercive uh, injunctive relief from the court for a person to actually present and hand over. Uh, in, in an insolvency context, we have public examinations, uh, outside of that context, it would need to be an order of the court in its inherent jurisdiction to force a person to hand over information, a mandatory injunction, if you will. But of course, if they simply choose not to and, and choose to take that information to them to jail or elsewhere, uh, that is right. There is no plan B. All right. Um, okay. So once again, the scenario comes in, you've got a deceased estate or uh, you know, perhaps family law. Um when you take the asset over in the sense that somebody gives you the ability to deal with it, um, what's the practical thing that you need to do to turn it into a bank account? Because, I mean, we've all seen the way that the prices of these things swing around. I'm assuming you don't want to be sitting on a $2 million portfolio when it crashes and turns into um, nothing. Um, so what sort of time frame would you need to get it into, converted into money and then into your trust account? And how do you go about that in a practical sort of sense? Yeah, that's, again, a really practical and really sensible question, David. What I'd suggest is this. Uh, I'm an insolvency practitioner, but that's an analogue for being an executor. In either case, I'd suggest that the person who is now in charge of the asset should firstly move it to a place where only they have access to it, and that's particularly if it's in a decentralised wallet, because it may be that not one but multiple people might have that seed phrase, right. and so any of them could get in and grab the assets at a moment's notice. So what I'd suggest and the practical steps that we took in the matter I'm talking about is we did in fact transfer it to a new wallet set up by me where I then set up custodial arrangements for the seed phrase and that way they're then secure. So that deals yep. with the security piece and then you deal with the volatility aspect and I would agree with you it is sensible to move assets that are in highly volatile coins into a more stable asset class and the one we chose was BUSD or US dollar stable coin which is an asset-backed stablecoin, as the name suggests. And then if you want to turn them back into fiat currency or, or money, uh, you would need to use an exchange for that. And as Evan talked about that before, that's an off-ramp. So you would then transfer the money to, for example, one of the named accounts, CoinSpot, Binance, Qcoin, there's a number of them. Once it's there, it can be transferred into fiat currency, which then can appear in a bank account. And then it's back into a land where most lawyers will be aware of what to do with it from there. Right. So in terms of doing that, do I just jump onto Google and um, download uh, friendlywallet.com and then that's a, a safe way of going about that? Or, um, you know, if we're talking a substantial amount of money, what's the best way of setting up a wallet and undertaking those first few transfers before you're familiar well, given with that, that Evan did it for me, I'm going to let Evan take that question. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, a, a very valid question. And, and generally speaking, um, you would approach an exchange. You, sorry, you would approach um, securing your assets and, and getting an account the same way you would uh, at a personal level. Um, but again, you probably need to have those additional controls in place that would mitigate some of the risk in dealing with these assets, um, given obviously they're highly volatile and, and very much transferable. So, um, for somebody looking to set up an account to then convert assets from cryptocurrencies back to fiat, um, you'd be approaching one of these custodial services, CoinSpot, KuCoin, Binance, Binance, as Anthony has mentioned. Um, and it is truly just a matter of signing up with one of these exchanges and getting an account. Alternatively, there are there are services that do exist um, and, and they do go by different names, but generally speaking, institutional custodial offerings where they'll give you a bit more of a hybrid arrangement where you may be able to control your private keys, but the infrastructure where those assets are stored is under the control of this particular business. So giving the business the control of the private keys or the, or, and ultimate control of the assets, but the actual assets, assets themselves are, he, are held by this institutional business. So taking some of the onus off the, the appointee or the executor, but whilst maintaining full control 
of that asset. No worries. I might get some links from you and we'll distribute that with the video. It'll be on the basis, of sure. course, that uh, neither you nor we are actually recommending them, but at least they're reputable. And I assume that uh, a similar name is not safe. It's good. If it's binance.com.au, it's binance.net.au is not going to be this necessarily the same thing at all. And you've got to really stick very carefully to the full URL of the, um, the destination um, account. Is that correct? I, I think the appropriate risk controls need to be looked at when, when looking at a particular service uh, and then what controls that particular service offers you as somebody looking to secure assets. If there's, for example, multi-fact authentication, if there are additional security controls in place that will give the executor, for example, uh, what's known as a multi-signatory um, scenario where you know it may be a situation of Anthony and myself need to then approve every single tra transaction that goes out the door as opposed to a single executor signing a transaction. So... Um, looking at these different businesses, these different institutional account offerings uh, and their security controls and what they have in place, uh, a business can then determine what service they want to go with depending on their sort of risk appetite and the assets on hand. Thank you very much. All right, I think that should do it for the points that we'd uh, uh, had mapped out. Is there any other things that you think we've missed that you'd like to cover off? Um. No, I, I think I think I'm good. I mean, I, I I think we covered everything. Anthony, what do you? Yeah, I think that's been quite fulsome. I'm just going back through your list to make sure we've covered it. Taking trial, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. No, I think that's fine. Okay. I actually, Great. sorry, David. I think the, the only really thing we haven't touched on, and again, I don't know how relevant it is, but just the the, the tracing piece. Again, it probably comes down to it might not be in the in this scenario of a a well, it might be of a of a deceased estate, but I mean determining. You know the actual reach of somebody's portfolio or assets. It may extend just beyond that 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 identified wallet or ledger. So, if you want to go into the tracing piece at all and how we can trace these assets, we can do that. Otherwise, happy to leave it. Um, no, that that would be good. I mean, we may not end up using it, but we can all. Look. Yeah. I, I would imagine that this is just the start of a conversation, and we'll be asking for a more sort of in-depth. Uh, analysis yeah. because uh, as you probably picked up there's, there's several different scenarios the estate one's probably the most pressing but family law of course where you've got someone who's disclosed that they've got uh, 50,000 but you know for sure it's probably likely more and you need to go back and do the verification so tracing is certainly something that you know both in the scenarios where you've got someone that you can ask for assistance or whether you've they've you know sworn to the fact that they've given you all of the assets that um, you're looking for or alternatively, a straight out hostile where they've nicked off with it and you're trying to get it back. So any observations you've got would certainly be useful, I think. Yeah, sure. Do you want, do you want to make some observations or do we use it? Or maybe if we just or... sort of frame it. Um, okay, so, you know, in the estate scenario, obviously, if they're dead, you can't ask them questions, but there might be other circumstances. We mentioned, um, Anthony mentioned family law where you need to verify the disclosed amount and ordinarily you go back and ask for a bank statement or something along those lines. How do you go about tracing assets where um, you really don't know where they are and you've only got the very first hints about um, the fact that money was paid out at some point? Yeah, sure. And I think I think I touched on this earlier, and then Anthony mentioned earlier. But you know, it is it is it is truly remarkable how open and transparent the blockchain really is. Uh, I think that really comes to the misconception of of what blockchain and broadly digital assets uh, are thought of in 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 the broader industry. Uh, you know, there is a general concept. Uh, there is a general perception that once funds have gone into the digital realm, that they are uh, lost forever. But um, that really couldn't be further than the truth. And and I would actually argue that. Uh, digital assets are more traceable and transparent than, than than fiat currencies are due to this open and public and transparent nature of the blockchain. So um, to the benefit of investigators, executives, trustees, uh, there are specific blockchain intelligence tools, tools that exist that allow investigators the ability to go ahead and trace uh, cryptocurrency transactions on a given blockchain. Now, not only can you trace these transactions, but you can actually attribute certain addresses uh, to real world entities um, based on intelligence provided to that particular blockchain intelligence provider. So that is, um, rather than a transaction between uh, your deceased estate and a, a random public key, that transaction may actually be a transaction to another digital currency exchange. So you've gone from having not a whole lot of information about this transaction, all you see on the blockchain is a transaction between your deceased estate and a, another public address, but 
that might be another cryptocurrency exchange based in a separate jurisdiction unknown to the executor or the family involved so um, the most critical part of yeah, um, of this process is having that intelligence on hand to make well-informed decisions uh, about the flow of cryptocurrency. So having that intelligence on hand is critical for executives, trustees, and general investigators and practitioners when dealing with these digital assets. Thank you very much. I think we will leave it there. The concept is a, a short, sharp <coughs> video. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure our insurers will be very happy with um, people storing the private keys in their, I mean, we tell them not to, but they'd probably put them on their network somewhere. And um, yeah, I wouldn't be doing that. We'll be looking for another option. Um, Do solicitors uh, offer custody services? I remember that was a, a point back when we had uh, title deeds, back when I studied law. When I yeah, we offer a safe custody, but they're usually just not secure enough. Um, so yeah. they're, you know, some, some have a dirty great safe somewhere, but the majority it's probably a fireproof double filing cabinet. And I'm not really sure you'd want half a million dollars worth of what is essentially, you know, um, pretty portable asset. And all you need is somebody that knows what they're doing in your conveyancing department. Um, uh, and you could buy yourself a major problem there, I think. Yeah. Um, I think the, the better option is the person who has the crypto asset having the seed phrase in their possession and having it in the possession of one other trusted person. Yeah. Uh, and for example, <clears throat> in that person's safe. So um, that means if uh, if worse comes to worse, at least you know where to look. Yes. But it's not, as you say, with the solicitor. There is a uh -huh. um, there is a service called Crypto Lock, um, a Brisbane company that might be of interest to you, and they do offer something like that. It's an encrypted, uh, basically, you know, uh, Gmail equivalent, and uh, you nominate a trusted person. And they can only access it once that once you passed away. So, you know, effectively you've got the custodial arrangement in place, but then you've at least got someone you've got to go to and show them the death certificate before you, you find out that your brother in law had a um, gambling problem you didn't know about. Um, so that so that's one of those institutional services, as I right, mentioned. So okay. generally speaking, you know, it, it acts as a bit of a hybrid environment. <laughs> so it, you can have them actually store your crypto and also retain a copy of your private key for emergency circumstances, or you can have, like you've just mentioned, David, uh, just the ability to store the private key in those emergency circumstances. So um, there is a bit of a distinction there. Uh, and there are sort of providers such as um, BitGo, Coinbase Custody, that can give you a hybrid arrangement. So they'll retain a copy of your private key for very much, uh, you know, break glass in the emergency case, uh, you lose your private keys, or they may just retain full custody of your assets. Uh, where that is, that is controlled, for example, behind multi-factor and other authentication controls. So, you know, it, it is very much a decision of the business uh, and, and the estate, let's call it, um, on how they store their assets. Um, you know, for the, for the most part, uh, you know, I've always, I've, I've been involved in this space for a long time and it has always put it in the safe. Um, but even that isn't <laughs> safe. Uh, we're dealing with a matter out of New Zealand where somebody's staple is actually physically stolen. So, um, you know, in that case, it's, it's not ideal. Um, so, yeah, yes. it, it is very much a look at your look at your situation and, and where you go from there. All right. Well, look, thank you very much for your time today. It's been um, highly illuminative, illuminative, and um, I'm sure, as I said, this is the first of a, a long series of conversations. So, we'll reach out again if they, if you've got the the time to speak to those discrete audiences because they they each have their different focus. I think. Definitely. Cheers. Thanks very much. <laughs>